everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another case study of The Dancing Professor. So we know that engineering psychology is a critical part of human factors. We also learned previously that human factors gained recognition in the aviation sector in the 1930s and 1940s following World War II. Today, we're going to learn about how ergonomics and training of operation systems uh, actually apply to current day aviation, and to help us learn about that is Mr. Guillermo Perez. Hello, Hi Guillermo. There. How are you? I'm very good. How about yourself? Good, thanks. Could you please start by introducing yourself and telling our viewers what it is that you do? Absolutely. Well, my name is Guillermo Perez, and uh, I'm a flight instructor, and we teach people from uh, recreational all the way to commercial, and we put people all the way to the airlines. Awesome. Thanks so much. So as an instructor, what would you say is the most important thing that you would recommend or advise to new students? Well, to new students, it's important that they know their equipment, they know what they're flying, and become extremely familiar with the uh, uh, machine. And not only the machine, you know, um, understand all the factors that apply to aviation. Awesome. So um, I'm aware that there are two sort of components to uh, learning how to fly, right? We have what you guys call ground school and then actually flying um, the aircraft. Could you tell us a little bit about those two components? That's correct. Uh, so aviation is two parts to it. It's not only going and learning how to fly an airplane, but what's behind it as well is uh, all the ground portion, which is self-study and uh, reading the materials to understand uh, not only the airplane, but the environment. And uh, there is a lot of factors that come into play. Like what? Uh, for instance, uh, at weather. That's one big factor, and uh, not only you got to understand weather, you got to understand the machine uh, systems, you got to understand on how to fly the airplane, aerodynamics, so um, medical factors too there, that apply to uh, human factors, uh, and uh, the student has to know whether he is capable of doing this thing or, or flying the aircraft on their. Um, if they're sick or if they're on their kind of medication, so they have to know all that as well. Wonderful. Um, so I have a question about the ground school portion. Um, you mentioned something about self-study. So is there a way that, you know, just as people go to school to study biology or chemistry, is there a way that instructors are there to actually teach students the material, the, the theory in the books? Absolutely. There is syllabus that uh, you'll find on the books. So there is guidance, there is uh, really good material out there. There's companies that put all these books uh, together and there is uh, syllabus that they can follow just like you would in, on any subject. Uh, you follow the syllabus and uh, that's you know a, kind of a, a way that we do things in aviation. And so there's another way that you could do it right, through self-study, which I imagine would maybe be less expensive, but take more time maybe? That's, a, that's, that's correct. So even on self-study, you can follow your own personal uh, syllabus. Uh, but whether or not the student is going to do it, it's, you know, is, is a little bit different. Uh, because there's nobody pushing you, you might not follow that syllabus. I see. Um, awesome. And so as an instructor, in your opinion, uh, based on your experience, what do you feel like students struggle with the most? Is there a certain pattern or a trend um, that maybe you noticed? Absolutely. Uh, well, students struggle a lot with the self-study um, because, you know, life gets on the way, work, uh, partying, and all these uh, factors in, in their lives. Uh, they get too busy and they forget to study the subjects. So um, the student is required to have a minimum amount of hours uh, to present to the FAA before they get their certificate. So uh, along with those hours, they have to have the knowledge. And if the knowledge doesn't meet or doesn't meet the training, then they will fail the test. So it's a big, big problem uh, from, uh, you know, the students uh, uh, part of it that, you know, self-study, it's a big, big issue. How about in the, air, in the aircraft? Is there any particular thing that you feel like most students have trouble with? 
Uh, well, in the aircraft, it's a little different, and it, it, it varies from person to person. Some people get it a lot sooner than others. Um, I find that mm, the, the student pilot that struggles the most is the one that has the most fear. So fear will get on the way, you know, from the learning curve. Uh, the pilot that has fear will, will have to repeat that over and over and over and over, and it's more challenging, we've found. Have you ever had a student that was fearful of flying but wanted to learn how to fly? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm dealing with one of the students that uh, he, uh, well, he's, he's afraid of flying, but once it gets in the air, he gets really excited and he forgets all about the fear and we come back down and he's back to being afraid of flying. Wow, that's fascinating. So, um, you know, it, it's actually directly related to psychological factors, right? When we become fearful, um, our ability to be rational and logical, right, as our viewers probably understand, um, sort of decreases, right? And so that that could be very, very important when operating something like an airplane or a car or really any form of technology, right? Um, we tend to behave differently than we would had we been actually calm and collected, as you mentioned before. Um, so yeah, that's actually very, very interesting. Um, okay, so according to previous research, right, um, ba back in the 1940s and even currently, um, there was this idea behind the fact of fitting the man to the job right? Not fitting the job to the man in the sense that we started creating training programs like personality tests, career assessments to see whether or not certain people have characteristics to perform a job better or worse than someone else. Mm -hmm. And specifically with aviation and operating systems in an aircraft, um, the idea was sort of that as long as someone was able to be intelligent enough and to possess particular psychomotor abilities, they would be able to be a successful pilot. Do you feel like that's true? Do you feel like there are certain people who are, you know, more naturally talented at being a good pilot? Or do you feel like anyone who puts in the correct amount of effort could actually be a successful pilot? Absolutely. You know, um, like I said, uh, different people behave differently in the aircraft. I found that, I don't know, for some strange reason, musicians make better pilots than most <laughs> other people. I don't know what it is, uh, women too, I don't know what it is that uh, when they're flying, their way of thinking, the way they, they put things together, you know, is so different than other, uh, for instance, the, uh, let's take a, uh, an engineer. Okay. An engineer overanalyzes everything in the cockpit, so he tends to take a long time to understand things because he wants to know it to the very detail. Um, a musician, it just flows with everything that he's doing and it tends to manage the aircraft smoother and uh, it, it is so strange. But yes, w different people behave different in the aircraft. That's so interesting. Awesome. And um, if you were to give a definition of what a good successful pilot is, what would you say those characteristics would be? Well, the uh, successful pilot is the, the pilot that puts the effort into learning uh, the machine, the environment, uh, and understands that it's a hard work. It's not only going and flying and have fun, but it's the dedication that he puts behind it, studying the material, understanding the machine, understanding the systems, is the pilot that succeeds in, in aviation. Wonderful. Um, okay, so speaking of pilot success in aviation, we know that, um, again, during World War II, a lot of issues were happening and, you know, mistakes were occurring, and a lot of these were attributed to what they called pilot error. However, it's not necessarily that the pilot was not performing correctly or was not aware of what he or she should have been doing, but more so that the system that was designed was not user-friendly and the pilot was not actually able to successfully perform his or her job. Do you ever feel like in your experience these days the, the, the design of a particular cockpit or the design of a particular system sort of inhibits a pilot to do his job well when he in fact knows how to do it? Well, there is definitely an evolution in aviation that it has changed so much, so much so that it's so friendly now to pilots. And, and every year we see a change in aircraft uh, automation and uh, is, it has definitely improved. 
the machines now that we see now, they're uh, phenomenal uh, versus the machines that we used to fly. There was no automation, there was confusion in the cockpit, the way they arranged the cockpit is, is so much better, it's more anatomically uh, friendly, so uh, levers, uh, switches, um, everything that you find inside the cockpit is just friendly and is not a bunch of uh, instruments um, just put in with no sense. So now you see uh, more and more aircraft that every year they change it. Every, day, every year they come up with something newer, better, faster, and uh, easier to fly. Okay, great. So about that, um, do you, I think you mentioned this to me earlier, but um, every pilot, even of a high, high ranking, right, who has pretty much all of his or her credentials, right, still has to stay current and still has to be updated with all of the new updates that are happening in the aviation technology. Is that correct? That's correct. As a matter of fact, in aviation, we have something that's called uh, cockpit resource management. Cockpit resource management is basically every six months, every year, we have to go back to training, we have to go back to the basics, and we have to do, uh, we simulate emergencies, we deal with uh, uh, human factors, we deal with uh, fires, uh, emergencies that we have to take care uh, and. Um, the problem is that when you don't take care of those things, uh, when you don't train that way, you start to forget. And when you forget is when the problems uh, start. Right. And that makes sense. I feel like that's true for really anything that we do, right? You know, if you don't use it, you lose it sort Absolutely. of a thing, right? So um, I just have one more question related to uh, the design of systems. So you mentioned that automation has, you know, come into the light these days. Um, do you feel like automation is good or bad? And do you ever feel like there are negative effects of automation in the sense that they reduce um, the workload in a way of the pilot? and almost make them lazier that when the automation fails that the pilot maybe does not actually step up and do what he or she is supposed to do? You know, it's funny that you're saying that because it's exactly true. Uh, when people have too much automation, they don't do uh, as well. You know, they, 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 there's a lack of study because they think the automation is going to save them. and. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of accidents and people relying a lot of on automation. And uh, it's one of the questions that the FAA asked in, a, in, the, um, in one of the written exams. Really? Uh, has automation become uh, uh, better or worse for, for pilots? And, and the answer is that it's actually uh, decreased the skill of pilots because now they rely so much on that automation and the pilot is relying so much on that that they forget how to even fly an airplane and uh, it's nice to have the automation to help you but you should go back to your you know the roots of your skills and and, and polish all that so that you're sharp so yes it, it has increased a lot of accidents because of the automation though awesome thanks so much so guillermo is actually going to show us one of his planes that he has here on the lot and we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the ergonomics of inside the cockpit let's go all right so guillermo where are we what what kind of a plane is this well, Olga, we're sitting here on a Cessna 172, 1979. Wow. And uh, we're still using these airplanes for training, believe it or not. You know, um, in airplanes, is different. It's not like a car, a 1979 car. Well, it will be on his last days. But <laughs> in an airplane, uh, so long as you maintain the aircraft, uh, so long as you maintain the engine, uh, you can still use even this uh, these airplanes. Um, what you're looking at over here on the instruments is basically, uh, they're called steam gauges. Okay. And now they have changed to automation, uh, so the automation that we have, now you will see screens, you will see touch screens, you will see uh, a much, much more sophisticated aircraft. We have some GPS's here that it helps us to navigate, but you can still see, these are called steam gauges and we're still using them now. Uh, and you'll see aircraft also jets with this kind of steam gauges. So yeah, we still use them here. 
I see. Okay. So, um, would you say that you have to pay attention to all of these gauges at the same time, or are there like certain ones that you monitor more than others? Well, you know, and, and this is what I teach all my students. It might look overwhelming, you know. Uh, uh, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit, because there's a lot of gauges. But like your car, you know, when you get in your car, you don't you don't look at everything, only the things that you need at that, at that time, right? So um, radios, obviously, once you tune it once, then you forget about that. If you don't need navigations, then you forget about the navigations. Uh, this is our typical, uh, we call it six-pack. On the six pack is basically uh, all the performance that you're getting out of the airplane. So uh, the most important instruments will be your six pack right here, and that's how you know whether your aircraft airplane is climbing, descending, and that's uh, the most important part to uh, get the information from the aircraft as far as the performance. Wonderful, and then. Um if you re recall previously, we were discussing the ergonomics of the cockpit and like the distance from the pilot, you know, to the controls, the pedals, anything like that. Do you feel like this is all uh, pretty user friendly for the pilot or is there anything that you feel like, oh, I wish this was here or I wish this was higher, this was lower? Uh, absolutely. Well, throughout the years, it has changed. Uh, now, uh, you see aircraft that have very minimum uh amount of uh, buttons and that's basically what you want as a pilot you want one button to control uh, most of the systems mm -hmm. so you will see uh, that in a new aircraft and now in an older aircraft so long as you know where the buttons are then uh, but yeah absolutely if it was if it was me I would change a lot of this to be more user friendly and is the reason that you still use these particular planes and with steam gauges just because it's more expensive to get new ones to train on um, or do you have to learn how to do it on steam gauges before you can actually advance to the computerized version uh, you absolutely don't have to use this to learn how to fly uh, the you know aviation is very very expensive to learn how to fly is very expensive so uh, what this machines would do it, it, they would make the, the training a lot easier and and cheaper to afford it you know what Got i mean it. so um in in a in a training you can easily spend up to two hundred thousand dollars just for oh. becoming a pilot oh and uh, unfortunately there is no help from the government there is no help as financial aid so this airplanes make it easier to uh to be able to afford it well, that's nice that you guys are helping people, you know, get closer to their dream and achieve their goals in a less expensive way. So that's great. Um, okay, and then just the final question. Could you sure. tell us um, why you chose to be a pilot? Well, and, and this this was a dream, basically a dream. You know, I had a dream when I was a little kid, and uh, most kids go and play with toys, uh, cars, motorcycles, guns, and all that stuff. But <laughs> my, my toys were all... Well, all airplanes. And, you know, I've been looking at the sky since I was uh, three years old. Uh, I think my mom said one of my uh, first words was uh, saying airplane, you know. And uh, since then, you know, I I look, I, I love looking up and uh, into the sky and going experience free flight. And it's, it's just an amazing, amazing uh, uh, experience. Thank you very, very much, Guillermo, for all of your amazing information. I'm sure our viewers will be very, very grateful for all of the stuff that you've told us today. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time for another case study of The Dancing Professor.